Welcome, guys. Those of you that may be new, maybe you don't know me, my name is Dan Esworthy. I'm the associate pastor here. As Dan put me on the spot, I will be the guy preaching today. Steve has this morning off. I want to start with a story. If you could put that picture up there. Oh, perfect. So this is our oldest kid, Addie. She's 11 now. This is her when she's about four or five. And I'll never forget the first time I took her to the movies. Because I did what every good parent does, run the way to the movies, and I pull into the dollar store because I'm like, I'm not paying 10 bucks for a pack of Skittles. So pull into the dollar store, load up our pockets with a bunch of candy, and we're leaving. But then I made one big mistake. Between the dollar store and the movies, I tried explaining to my firstborn daughter, who loves nothing more than rules, that technically you're not supposed to sneak candy into the movie theater. Like, I made this mistake, and she, she immediately got serious, and she was like, is this illegal? Are we going to jail? Like, she got stressed out. She was worried about it the whole way there. She's, like, really freaking out about it. When we got there, I was like, don't worry, baby girl. Just don't say anything. It's not a big deal. And so I'm like, well, we'll get a drink. We go up to the counter to get a drink, and I'm standing there, and there's this 16-year-old kid across the counter, and I get my drink, and I'm like, oh, we're home free. And then she looks up at me, and she goes, I don't know what I was so worried about, Dad. They didn't even ask about the candy in our pockets. And I was like, I'm looking at her and I'm like, dear God, don't let the kid behind the counter be a candy Nazi or something. And so I look up at him and I'm like, what are you going to do? He's like, enjoy your movie, man. I said, thank you. That's great. So the reason I tell that story is because I probably shouldn't have trusted my sweet little five-year-old with the news that we technically weren't supposed to do that. Today we're going to be talking about who should you trust? Where should your trust rest? What should it be in? If you've been here, if you were here last week, you remember Steve kind of walked us up right to the edge of a cliff and then was like, Dan's going to finish it up next week, right? Kind of dropped it on us. If you haven't been here, I'll give you the 30-second version. We've been in the book of Esther. I'm going to finish it up today. Esther is the story of God's people are under threat, right? Because there's this guy who's second in command of Persia who hates the Jews, and he kind of talked the king into setting up a day where everybody could attack the Jewish people and exterminate and annihilate them were the words that he used. And most of all, he hates one Jew in particular named Mordecai. Esther, being a, secretly, she's a Jew. She goes to the king, takes her life in her hands because you're not supposed to approach the king without him asking. When people are constantly trying to assassinate a king, you can't just sneak up on them, right? And so she took her life in her hands, went to the king. He grants her amnesty, and she, he says, what do you want? Like, you took your life in your hands. What's such a big deal? And she goes, come to dinner with me. You and Haman, I'd love to have you guys for dinner. That's where Steve stopped it last week. That's where we're going to start off right now. So Esther chapter 5, starting in verse 7. Esther answered. She's talking to the king. The king asked her, all right, we're at dinner. What do you need? She said, this is my petition and my request. If I have found favor in the eyes of the king, and if it pleases the king to grant my petition and perform my request, may the king and Haman come to the banquet I'll prepare for them tomorrow. I will do what the king has asked. That day Haman left full of joy and in good spirits. But when Haman saw Mordecai at the king's gate, and Mordecai didn't rise or tremble in fear at his presence, Haman was filled with rage toward Mordecai. Yet Haman controlled himself and went home. He sent for his friends and his wife Zeresh to join him. Then Haman described for them his glorious wealth and his many sons. He told them all how the king had honored him, and promoted him in rank over the other officials and the royal staff. What's more, Haman added, Queen Esther invited no one but me to join the king at the banquet she had prepared. I'm invited again tomorrow to join her with the king. Still, none of this satisfies me, since I see Mordecai the Jew sitting at the king's gate all the time. His wife Zeresh and all his friends told him, have them build a gallows 75 feet tall, ask the king in the morning to hang Mordecai on it. Then just go to the banquet with the king and enjoy yourself. The advice pleased Haman, so he had the gallows constructed. Some people think Esther kind of chickened out here. Like she goes to have the conversation and she kind of chickens out. Personally, this is just my opinion. I think we've seen as we go through this series, Esther, man, she's a woman who knows how to read a room. She's super socially conscious, and she just came off of fasting and likely praying for three days. So we don't know why, but something happened to where she was like, this isn't the right time, so I'm going to wait. We're going to find out that it's extremely providential that she did wait. Haman left this meeting hyped about how life's going until he ran into Mordecai, right? 
He's filled with rage. So he does what apparently Persians do when they're angry. He goes home and sets up this big brag session in front of his wife and all of his best friends and and finishes it by saying, none of this satisfies me since I see Mordecai the Jew. And things get bizarre. His family is like a scene from The Godfather, right? He tells them, hey, like there's this guy at work. (sighs) He's making me crazy. And his wife steps in and says, well, that's an easy fix. We just build a gallows in the front yard, 75 feet tall, and uh, hang that guy on it. Problem solved, you go enjoy your dinner. Can we just like, for a moment, sometimes we read stuff in the Bible and we're so used to hearing it that we just kind of overlook how strange and bizarre it is. Imagine if I went home today after service to my wife and I said, man, that Dan Bradley guy. Every time I get up there to preach, it's only every once in a while, folds his arms, goes right to sleep. Could you imagine if my wife's answer to that was, you know what we do? 75 foot tall gallows in the front yard. You go to the staff meeting tomorrow morning, ask Steve if you can off him. It's bizarre and weird. Just to be clear, I have no beef with Dan Bradley. I think he's a great dude. I love him. It was just too good to pass it up. He's extremely jacked up. In chapter 6, we'll find out why it was so providential. The king can't sleep. We don't know if he's worried about the empire, if he's worried about the queen, like what would make her take her life in in her hands to come and talk to me? But he says, hey, the most boring thing he can think of is bring me the daily events of my reign. It'd be like reading the phone book, anything to put me to sleep. And so they pick just a scroll at random. They find one from a couple years ago, and they end up reading to him about how Mordecai foiled this plot to kill the king. And when people are trying, constantly trying to assassinate you, it's a pretty good idea to reward the people that stop that. And so he asks, asks his servant, he says, hey, what do we do for Mordecai? The servant says, we didn't do a thing for him. And he says, well, I'm the king. I don't know what anybody wants, but we've got to remedy this. I get everything I want. I don't know what the average guy would want as a reward. Who's standing outside that I could ask about this? Providentially, Haman's standing outside preparing to give his big speech to King Ahasuerus, like, all right, this is why Mordecai is a public enemy. We've got to get rid of him. And he says, oh, that's perfect. Send Haman in. And this is how the conversation goes. Verse 6. Haman entered and the king asked him, what should be done for the man the king wants to honor? Haman thought to himself, who is it the king would want to honor more than me? Haman told the king, for the man the king wants to honor, have them bring a royal garment that the king himself has worn and a horse the king himself has ridden on which has a royal crown on its head. Put the garment and the horse under the charge of one of the king's most noble officials. Have them clothe the man the king wants to honor. Parade him on the horse through the city square and call out before him, this is what is done for the man the king wants to honor. The king told Haman, hurry and do just as you proposed. And then here's the punchline. Take a garment and a horse for Mordecai, the Jew who's sitting at the king's gate. Don't leave out anything you have suggested. Doubtless, Haman had his speech planned, right? To go in there and just paint Mordecai as public enemy number one. His jaw has to be on the floor because this is not how the day was supposed to go. He was supposed to show up, paint this picture of Mordecai, apparently gruesomely murder the guy he doesn't like, and then go enjoy a nice dinner. But this is not how things go until verse 10. Instead of leading Mordecai to his death, he ends up leading Mordecai around town as his personal valet, shouting about how great he is. I find myself wondering, it's not in the text, but I kind of wonder if he had to walk by his own house with that big gallows in the front yard, yelling about how great Mordecai is. And we start to see hints of what God's doing here, some foreshadowing. Because Mordecai was supposed to die, and instead he's honored. God's working implicitly, right? We've talked about that in the book of Esther. You never hear God mentioned explicitly. but he was there. Haman goes home after he gets done walking Mordecai around mournful with his head covered. It says he had his head covered, which is a sign of mourning. And there's this weird reversal, right? Because you remember last week, Steve was talking about how Mordecai is covered in ashes because he's mourning for what's coming for the Jewish people. And now you see he's been honored and Haman's going home mourning for what's going on. He goes home and his wife and his friends, they don't help a situation. Verse 13. Haman told his wife Zeresh and all his friends everything that had happened. His advisors and his wife, Zeresh, said to him, since Mordecai is Jewish and you've begun to fall before him, you will overcome him because your downfall is certain. 
While they were still speaking with him, the king's eunuchs arrived and rushed Haman to the banquet Esther had prepared. Up until now, Haman's been the guy in control, right? And suddenly things spin out of control. You might ask yourself, well, why would his wife suddenly change to saying, your downfall is certain now. If he's Jewish and this is the way things are going, it's over for you, bub. Why would she suddenly say that? We think it's probably because if you read your Old Testament, it was really well known what happened when Yahweh, the God of the Jews, decided that he was going to take up for his people. Everybody heard the story of the Exodus, what happens. You can't, if Yahweh decides he's going to do something, there's no standing against him. And he gets home and his wife's like, so you went to go kill the guy and instead you ended up leading him around town? Sounds like his God's at work. You don't stand a chance. Even his wife recognizes that God is doing something in the background. So he leaves home in the shadow of this giant gallows, not realizing the next time he comes home, he'll be the one that's on it. Start in verse 1 of chapter 7. This is really important, so listen up, guys. The king and Haman came to feast with Esther the queen. Once again on the second day, while drinking wine, the king asked Esther, Queen Esther, whatever you ask will be given to you. Whatever you seek, even to half the kingdom, will be done. Queen Esther answered, If I have found favor with you, your majesty, and if the king is pleased, spare my life. This is my request. And spare my people. This is my desire. For my people and I have been sold to destruction, death, and annihilation. If we'd merely been sold as male and female slaves, I would have kept silent. Indeed, the trouble wouldn't be worth burdening the king. King Ahasuerus spoke up and asked Queen Esther, Who is this? And where is the one who would devise such a scheme? Esther answered, The adversary and enemy is this evil Haman. Haman stood terrified before the king and queen. The king arose in anger and went from where they were drinking to wine to the palace garden. Haman remained to beg Queen Esther for his life because he realized the king was planning something terrible for him. Just as the king returned from the palace garden to the banquet hall, Haman was falling on the couch where Esther was reclining. The king exclaimed, Would he actually violate the queen while I'm in the house? As soon as the statement left the king's mouth, they covered Haman's face. Harbona, one of the king's eunuchs, said, There's a gallows 75 feet tall at Haman's house that he made for Mordecai, who gave the report that saved the king. The king said, Hang him on it. They hanged Haman on the gallows he prepared for Mordecai. Then the king's anger subsided. We see Haman's story is the epitome of Proverbs 26, verse 27. I love how the message puts it. It's really succinct. It says, Malice backfires and spite boomerangs. When you plant evil for someone else, usually it has a way of boomeranging and coming right back towards you. This has been kind of a caricature, right? And you guys ever have that done where you go somewhere and they draw a caricature of you and they kind of accentuate certain features like your chin or your ears or something? That's what's going on here. They're drawing attention to certain features of Haman because he's drawn as the ultimate bad guy. When this story is told at Purim, which you guys will find out what that is here in a little bit if you don't know, they have celebrations and they retell this story about Esther and Haman and Mordecai and the problem with the Jews. And every time they mention Haman's name, everybody boos and hisses and yells, Haman the horrible! And everybody in the crowd gets into it and boos and hisses at him. The problem is, if we just boo and hiss and keep moving, we don't really learn anything. I love what Mike Cosper says about what happened with Haman. He says, responsibility for Haman's downfall lay with Haman. His grandiose vision led him to presume that the king would want to honor him above all his other subjects. It also led to his resentment of Mordecai and the building of a spectacular 75-foot stake. Those who resisted his spectacular authority, he thought, deserve a spectacular death. Yet it was he, not Mordecai, who became the spectacle. And then this is the really important part, guys. Grasping for power like grasping for anything, will ultimately lead to self-destruction. That thing we grasp for, that thing we've deluded ourselves into believing, holds the key to making us ultimately and spectacularly happy. It can't be held on to, and it will ultimately eat you alive. Haman was a proud and angry man. And some of you might not know this. I know when I was going through some counseling, one of my counselors explained this to me, and it was super helpful so I want to kind of share it with you guys. Haman, man, the guy's angry, right? He rages at the littlest thing he thinks is an inconvenience or a problem for him. 
One thing you may not have heard, not always, but usually anger is what a lot of counselors call a bodyguard emotion. Usually when you're angry, there's something behind the anger, right? It's usually just not angry for angry's sake. Usually you're angry because you're really deep down, you're afraid, or you're offended, or you feel disrespected. Usually anger is just the thing that everybody else sees, so they don't have to see what's really going on behind that anger. Something rubbed up against Haman's pride and his anger flared. I'm not going to hang out here for a long time because we have a lot of time to ground. We have a lot of ground to cover. But just ask yourself, when does your anger flare? What makes you mad? Really mad? What's behind that? Because we can see in Haman's story, it didn't go well for him. Haman's this picture of unforgiveness and pride growing until it masters you. A lot of you probably remember the story of Cain and Abel back in Genesis 4. They both bring the sacrifice to God, and God says Abel's is acceptable. Cain's, we don't know why, it wasn't acceptable. God approaches him because he knows something's going on with Cain. In verse 5, Genesis 4, it says, Cain was very angry and his face was downcast. The Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it. Man, that picture of sin crouching at your door, in the original language, it was this word picture of a predator in the tall grass hunting you down. And the thing God is trying to tell Cain and that we need to learn from Haman's story is that if we find ourselves in that kind of situation, we have to repent and stop and turn from it and go the other way. You have to face the problem. But I think we get this wrong a lot, at least I do, when it comes to repenting. We have a really bad habit, I think, especially in the American church, that we like results. And so we turn away from it, but we just do a little behavior modification. We're like, I'm going to stop doing this, so I'll just start doing that. But it doesn't work, right? The thing about repenting is you don't just turn away from this, you turn to God. And you do what he calls you to do, but you do it with him. It's not just stop doing this. It's stop doing this, turn around, and turn to God. God doesn't just want us to face the problem. He wants, to fa- he wants us to face the problem with him, and as we'll see here in a little bit, to do it with, with others, with the church, with the people he's put in our lives. Haman's pride and anger, they ate him alive. He made everything about himself. He's like the master manipulator. Everything's done in his strength. Mordecai refuses to kneel, and that's about me. That's what Haman thought. Of course the king would want to honor me. Who else would be more likely to be honored than me? The queen, did you guys hear? She invited just me to this banquet. Everything's about him. All of his trust is in himself. He doesn't trust in anybody else. He says, Haman can do this. Everything's about me. Haman's the picture of pride and anger allowed to burn out of control and eventually just burn his whole life to the ground. He's a picture that we need to see. Some of you might be asking yourself the question, in this book about Esther, Dan, why are we talking about Haman so much? Let's see what's going on with her. One thing I never noticed until this week as I was studying to finish up these last five chapters was this movement in Esther from we see in chapter 2, verse 10, where Mordecai comes to her and he tells her, hey, don't tell anybody you're Jewish. Take that faith, take that faith keep it under wraps. And we've kind of talked, if you, don't know, if you don't understand where I'm coming from with this, go back and watch one of Steve, a couple of Steve's sermons. But Esther kind of hit her faith. And we think it's probably most likely she became this woman of compromise who, was, who compromised and she was like, those Jews, they are my people. That's not who I am. But then we see her move from being alone to becoming part of God's people. It's subtle, but you can see it. Chapter 4, Mordecai is telling her, hey, you've got to go to the king, and you've got to talk to him about what's set up for your people. And he uses these words in Esther chapter 4, verse 8. He says, he's talking to a servant who's going to talk to her. He says, command her to approach the king, implore his favor, and plead with him personally for her people. The same guy who told her not to claim him anymore. Esther ends up ultimately agreeing and saying, hey, I'm going to fast with you. You guys fast with me. We're going to do this together. She's the opposite of Haman. right? When her back's against the wall, she embraces her faith 
and the people of God. Steve's kind of talked about this at length in this series. I think it's an apt description of who Esther was. He's talked about how she was likely the Kim Kardashian of her day, right? She got into this system, and even though it was a rough place for her to be, she kind of decided to work the system, and she owned it. But this isn't about her social savvy or how beautiful she was. At the end of the day, it's all about trusting God to come, to come through for his people. Mordecai even told her that, right? He said, God's going to bring salvation from someone for his people. Is it going to be you? Or are you going to be a part of that? Esther has to look past all of her wounds because she's a complex woman. We're not just painting her as a bad guy, as a, as, a, as a terrible person. She's got a complex life, and she's got tons of wounds just like all of us. We know from the text, both of her parents died when she was young. She's raised by her cousin Mordecai, and then she's plucked from home and stuck in this harem for one of the most ruthless men on the planet, and then ends up being married to him. Doubtless, she's carrying wounds, but she doesn't let those wounds keep her from coming home. You may not have noticed it, but Esther's story mirrors the story of the prodigal son quite a bit. Right? As soon as she gets in there, she's in this lap of luxury, and she just embraces it, starts working the system. But eventually, the bottom drops out, and she has a choice to make. Does she stay in the grime where she's been, or does she go home to God and to his people? Esther's no Daniel. That's the thing I love about this. Steve's talked about this a ton. A lot of times when we look at different people in the Bible, man, we like the people that just kill it. Daniel, in the Old Testament, the guy walks around with a cape on. He can't do any wrong. We look at Daniel and we're like, that's what I want to be like. That guy kills it, right? He went to the lion's den because he wouldn't stop praying. But man, people like Esther, man, I can identify with her because she's a woman who started out as from what we can see, a woman of compromise. I, doubtless, the Jews thought to themselves when they heard that Esther is going to approach the king, they're like, that's not the person you give the ball to when there's only 10 seconds on the clock. Give the ball to Daniel. That guy we can trust. Esther, I don't think she's going to come through. That's not the person that we trust. At least that's, a, that's what they would think. Because we think, man, God can trust a Daniel, but an Esther? I don't know. I think the reason we get so judgmental is because when I really look at who Esther was and her wounds and what she did, I see a little too much of myself in her story. Because if I'm honest, there's lots of times in life where I'm willing to compromise if it suits me. We have a saying around here that we've, we say quite a bit, progress, not perfection. God wants us to be perfect for sure, but he knows it's a process to get there. We just have to take that next step of faith. Me and my wife, when we were buying our first house, it was 2008, we just got married. And the only thing we could afford was a destroyed bank-owned home. And so we went from nasty house to nasty house, and we ended up coming to one. We walked through it, and we got home, and we were like, this is the one. This is the house we want. It's a wreck, but we want it. And we called our realtor at the time, and we said, hey, that's the one we want. She said, no, you don't. We said, yeah, for sure, that's the house he wants. She's like, it's too much work, you do not want it. And we said, well, I'm pretty sure you work for us, so put in the bid. She put it in, we bought the house, ended up working on it, turning it around. Most of the time, when we look at ourselves and we see how likely we are to compromise and do the wrong thing, we think God would look at us and say, that one's too far gone. But in all honesty, if we look at Scripture, if we look at the gospel, it's the opposite. But this is the interesting thing. The gospel doesn't say what we would expect because culture usually says, yeah, you're a wreck, but there's something beautiful underneath it that we just need to expose. But that's not the gospel. The gospel doesn't say, you're beautiful, you just got some problems. It gets on our nerves, it gets under our skin because the gospel says, no, you're a wreck. <laughs> For sure you're a wreck and you know it. But instead of hearing condemnation, when we turn to Jesus, we hear God say, lucky for you, I love Rex. Rex are my specialty. That's the kind of God we follow. That's why Esther was somebody that they could, they could expect to come through. 
Let's finish the story. Chapter 8. The king gives Esther Haman's estate. Esther gives it to Mordecai. Mordecai ends up taking Haman's job. The thing is, there's still this problem of this looming date where the Jews are going to get exterminated. That's the wording that they used. Two months later, if you look at the scripture and look at the dates, it's actually two months later. It doesn't look like that when you read through it. Two months later, she takes her life in her hands again and goes back before the king and says, hey, we have to do something. This day is coming, and it's going to be awful for me and my people. We've got to figure this out. And the king says, he grants her amnesty first because she took her life in her hands going in there. And he goes, hey, in Persia, when the law's on the books, it's on the books. There's not a lot I can do about it. The king of Mordecai come up with this plan to say, okay, we'll write another law where the Jews can protect themselves. And we'll send it out all over the empire. Esther 8.17 says, In every province and every city, wherever the king's command and his law reached, joy and rejoicing took place among the Jews. There was a celebration and a holiday, and many of the ethnic groups of the land professed themselves to be Jews because fear of the Jews had overcome them. The day of the edict comes. I wish I could spend more time here, but we're covering a lot of ground today. The day of the edict comes in Susa and throughout the empire. The Jews protect themselves, and ultimately, this empire that had been so dangerous to be a Jew is now a lot safer place if you're Jewish than it was before. The day that was supposed to be their destruction became a day of salvation. Esther's full of all these reversals. Mordecai's honored by Haman instead of being killed. Haman ends up on the gallows that he built instead of Mordecai. Esther starts out as this woman of compromise and becomes this beautiful picture of conviction, willing to lay down her life for others. A day that looked like defeat became a day of victory. And if you're a follower of Jesus, that's something you should look at and say, oh, this sounds familiar. It's exactly what happened at the cross. It looked like Jesus went to the cross and was defeated, and instead God used it to bring ultimate victory for those of us that would call him Lord and Savior. Interestingly, the Jews did something that we also do. I'll explain here in a little bit. Not this specific holiday, but they wanted to make sure that this story wasn't forgotten. Esther 9.28 says, These days are remembered and celebrated by every generation, family, province, and city, so that these days of Purim will not lose their significance in Jewish life, and their memory will not fade from their descendants. The Jews knew the importance of remembering, of creating moments to remind you that we follow a God that always comes through, usually in ways we wouldn't expect or we wouldn't think that he would. One thing I like about Esther, because it's completely different from a lot of other parts of Scripture, is we see time and again in Scripture that God uses miracles to save his people. Now, it's not as common as it looks to us. If you actually look at the time frame, miracles aren't all that common in Scripture. If you look at how often they happen and what goes on. But I love how this is different, because we're used to miracles, right? The story of Exodus, miracle after miracle. The story of Daniel, you drop them in a lion's den, suddenly they're not hungry. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego... They come out safe. I love what Mark Mangano says about this. He says, But in the book of Esther, God works without miracles, through seemingly insignificant events and through the decisions of flawed people. God delivered an entire race of people in Persia because the king had a sleepless night, because a man would not bow to his superior, because a woman found herself taken to the bedroom of a ruthless man for a night of pleasure. Esther is this flawed and complex woman who comes to be a woman of conviction instead of compromise. She comes home to her God and to her people. And just like the prodigal, she comes home and there's feasting and forgiveness. This holiday that they put in place to remember. The book ends, chapter 10. It's really short. It's just a couple verses. Talking about Mordecai using his life for others. It says, Mordecai the Jew was second only to King Ahasuerus. He was famous among the Jews and highly esteemed by many of his relatives. He continued to pursue prosperity for his people and to speak for the well-being of all his descendants. Mordecai spent the rest of his life working for the good of others. Mike Cosper, I quoted him earlier, says this. He says, our lives are meant to be spent in this world, poured out like Jesus' own. We're meant for meaningful risk. 
not for mere self-protection. Mordecai could have easily sat back and said, I did my part. Time for my ties on the beach. Right? He could have said, I did what I was supposed to do. Instead, he keeps doing the right thing. I remember um, my father-in-law had this house up on the west side, and when they bought their house, the, the fence around the backyard was kind of falling apart, and it wasn't so much a privacy fence anymore because it was falling apart, and he was like, I don't want to redo the whole thing. So he went down to his brother's house and got a couple of bamboo plants and brought them back and just told me he had like nine or ten of them. And he said, I'm going to plant these around the yard, and they're going to cover the whole yard, and nobody will be able to see through here. And I remember looking at him and saying, Rick, there's like nine of them. Your yard is huge. There's no way that's enough. And he looked at me and he said, give it a year. When we come out here in a year, I'm going to have to cut this stuff back because it's going to make a border all the way around my backyard. And I said, okay, sure. Sure enough, that next summer I walk out there and I'm helping him cut the stuff back because it just multiplied like crazy because it's invasive. A lot of times in the church, we talk about how that's true with sin, about how that's true with bad stuff. If you start sinning, a lot of times it just gets worse and you start to see it pop up in other places. But it's also true when we live righteously. When you do the right thing, we see that in Mordecai's life, it multiplies. You start to see righteousness popping up in other parts of your life. I always finish with the so what. So what's this look like for me as I go back into life? I love in this book that there's no shallow change. Nobody gets to the end of this book and they say, that was a close one. Let's go back to doing what we were doing. Everybody's changed in this book. So I wanted to finish with two things. Number one, ask yourself, what am I supposed to do? Who do I identify with in this story? And be honest. Maybe it's more than one person. Maybe you're like, I'm actually, if I'm 100% honest, quite a bit like Haman. This dude was consumed by anger and pride. The roadblocks that God puts in front of you, take them as an opportunity to repent. It's what Haman should have done and he didn't. One of our core values here at Thrive is together. We say like, we, not me. Right? You can't do things on your own. There's no biblical model for following Jesus all by yourself. There's just not. If you're going to follow God, you have to do it with his people. Esther, maybe you're more like her. She chose to come home to her God and to her people, even though she likely felt unworthy. And if we're being honest, the people of God, sometimes they can be hurtful. Sometimes the scariest part about this is you're like, no, I understand the coming home to God, but it's the coming home to the people that scares me. Can I just tell you, yeah, we're a work in progress, every single one of us. But God will do amazing things if you'll trust him to work things out. But you have to come to him and to his people. It's not something you can do by yourself. Mordecai, maybe you're here and you're like, man, I've been a Christian for a long time. I'm not a whole lot like Haman. I'm not a whole lot like Esther. But Mordecai, we can see he spent the rest of his life pouring himself out for other people. If Thrive, if you call yourself a follower of Jesus, our number one command is to be a disciple that makes disciples that makes disciples. Are you doing that? Is that important to you? Does it even cross your mind that that's what you're supposed to be doing? Now, those disciples might be the kids that you get to wake up every Monday morning to send to school. They might be your grandkids. They might be that person at work that doesn't want to have anything to do with Jesus. Because discipleship is just, man, helping people take that next step towards Jesus. That's what we need to be doing. Maybe you need to say, honestly, like that hasn't even been on my radar. I don't know that I make disciples. I don't know that I even think about it. Maybe you need to stop and say, all right, who's in my life? Who has God put here intentionally for me to reach, for me to lead closer to him. Number two, we need to ask ourselves, what does this say about God? If you didn't grab communion, I want to pause for a second. Go ahead and pop your hand up in the air. Somebody will run you communion. I'm actually one of those. I forgot to grab one. So if somebody could run communion up here for the guy that's preaching, that would be stellar. But I wanted to finish with communion because it's important for us to recognize that what this says about God is he's, thank you, Dan, you're the man, dude. Thank you, bro. He's the God who always comes through. Usually not in the way that we expect, 
the Jews, man, they set up this holiday so they would remember that God comes through. He's the one that we can depend on. And every week, we have our own moment to remind us, man, God has been faithful. Look what Jesus did on the cross just because he loves us, just because he wanted to glorify the Father.